This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. Night and Day by Virginia Woolf. Chapter 14. Mr. Clacton was in his glory. The machinery which he had perfected and controlled was now about to turn out its bi-monthly product, a committee meeting, and his pride in the perfect structure of these assemblies was great. He loved the jargon of committee rooms. He loved the way in which the door kept opening as the clock struck the hour in obedience to a few strokes of his pen on a piece of paper, and when it had opened sufficiently often, he loved to issue from his inner chamber with documents in his hands, visibly important with a preoccupied expression on his face that might have suited a prime minister advancing to meet his cabinet. By his orders the table had been decorated beforehand with six sheets of blotting paper, with six pens, six ink-pots, a tumbler and a jug of water, a bell, and in deference to the taste of the lady members, a vase of hardy chrysanthemums. He had already surreptitiously straightened the sheets of blotting paper in relation to the ink-pots, and now stood in front of the fire engaged in conversation with Miss Markham. But his eye was on the door, and when Mary and Mrs. Seal entered he gave a little laugh and observed to the assembly which was scattered about the room, "'I fancy, ladies and gentlemen, that we are ready to commence.' So speaking, he took his seat at the head of the table, and arranging one bundle of papers upon his right and another upon his left, called upon Miss Dashett to read the minutes of the previous meeting. Mary obeyed. A keen observer might have wondered why it was necessary for the secretary to knit her brows so closely over the tolerably matter-of-fact statement before her. Could there be any doubt in her mind that it had been resolved to circularize the provinces with leaflet number three, or to issue a statistical diagram showing the proportion of married women to spinsters in New Zealand, or that the net profits of Mrs. Hipsley's bazaar had reached a total of five pounds, eight shillings, and two pence halfpenny? Could any doubt as to the perfect sense and propriety of these statements be disturbing her? No one could have guessed from the look of her that she was disturbed at all. A pleasanter and saner woman than Mary Dashett was never seen within a committee room. She seemed a compound of the autumn leaves and the winter sunshine. Less poetically speaking, she showed both gentleness and strength, an indefinable promise of soft maternity blending with her evident fitness for honest labor. Nevertheless, she had great difficulty in reducing her mind to obedience, and her reading lacked conviction, as if, as was indeed the case, she had lost the power of visualizing what she read. And directly the list was completed, her mind floated to Lincoln's Inn Fields, and the fluttering wings of innumerable sparrows. Was Ralph still enticing the bald-headed cock-sparrow to sit upon his hand? Had he succeeded? Would he ever succeed? She had meant to ask him why it is that the sparrows in Lincoln's Inn's field are tamer than the sparrows in Hyde Park. Perhaps it is that the passerbys are rarer, and they come to recognize their benefactors. For the first half-hour of the committee meeting, Mary had thus to do battle with the skeptical presence of Ralph Denham, who threatened to have it all his own way. Mary tried half a dozen methods of ousting him. She raised her voice. She articulated distinctly. She looked firmly at Mr. Clacton's bald head. She began to write a note. To her annoyance, her pencil drew a little round figure on the blotting paper, which, she could not deny, was really a bald-headed cock-sparrow. She looked again at Mr. Clacton. Yes, he was bald, and so are cock-sparrows. Never was a secretary tormented by so many unsuitable suggestions, and they all came, alas, with something ludicrously grotesque about them, which might, at any moment, provoke her to such flippancy as would shock her colleagues for ever. The thought of what she might say made her bite her lips, as if her lips would protect her. But all these suggestions were but flotsam and jetsam cast to the surface by a more profound disturbance, which, as she could not consider it at present, manifested its existence by these grotesque nods and beckonings. Consider it, she must, when the committee was over. Meanwhile, she was behaving scandalously. She was looking out of the window, and thinking of the color of the sky, and of the decorations on the Imperial Hotel, when she ought to have been shepherding her colleagues and pinning them down to the matter in hand. She could not bring herself to attach more weight to one project than to another. Ralph had said, she could not stop to consider what he had said, but he had somehow divested the proceedings of all reality. And then, without conscious effort, by some trick of the brain, she found herself becoming interested in some scheme for organizing a newspaper campaign. Certain articles were to be written certain editors approached. 
what line was it advisable to take? She found herself strongly disapproving of what Mr. Clacton was saying. She committed herself to the opinion that now was the time to strike hard. Directly she had said this, she felt that she had turned upon Ralph's ghost, and she became more and more in earnest, and anxious to bring the others round to her point of view. Once more she knew exactly and indisputably what is right and what is wrong, as if emerging from a mist, the old foes of the public good loomed ahead of her, capitalists, newspaper proprietors, anti-suffragists, and in some ways most pernicious of all, the masses who take no interest one way or another, among whom, for the time being, she certainly discerned the features of Ralph Denham. Indeed, when Miss Markham asked her to suggest the names of a few friends of hers, she expressed herself with unusual bitterness. "'My friends think all this kind of thing useless.' She felt that she was really saying that to Ralph himself. "'Oh, they're that sort, are they?' said Miss Markham, with a little laugh, and with renewed vigour their legions charged the foe. Mary's spirits had been low when she entered the committee room, but now they were considerably improved. She knew the ways of this world. It was a shapely, orderly place. She felt convinced of its right and its wrong, and the feeling that she was fit to deal a heavy blow against her enemies warmed her heart and kindled her eye. In one of those flights of fancy, not characteristic of her, but tiresomely frequent this afternoon, she envisaged herself battered with rotten eggs upon a platform, from which Ralph vainly begged her to descend. But what do I matter compared with the cause, she said, and so on. Much to her credit, however, teased by foolish fancies, she kept the surface of her brain moderate and vigilant, and subdued Mrs. Seal very tactfully, more than once, when she demanded, Action! Everywhere! At once! as became her father's daughter. The other members of the committee, who were all rather elderly people, were a good deal impressed by Mary, and inclined to side with her and against each other, partly, perhaps, because of her youth. The feeling that she controlled them all filled Mary with a sense of power, and she felt that no work can equal in importance, or be so exciting as, the work of making other people do what you want them to do. Indeed, when she had won her point, she felt a slight degree of contempt for the people who had yielded to her. The committee now rose, gathered together their papers, shook them straight, placed them in their attaché cases, snapped the locks firmly together, and hurried away, having for the most part to catch trains, in order to keep other appointments with other committees, for they were all busy people. Mary, Mrs. Seal, and Mr. Clacton were left alone. The room was hot and untidy. The pieces of pink blotting paper were lying at different angles upon the table, and the tumbler was half full of water, which someone had poured out and forgotten to drink. Mrs. Seal began preparing the tea, while Mr. Clacton retired to his room to file the fresh accumulation of documents. Mary was too much excited even to help Mrs. Seal with the cups and saucers. She flung up the window and stood by it, looking out. The street lamps were already lit, and through the mist in the square one could see little figures hurrying across the road and along the pavement on the farther side. In her absurd mood of lustful arrogance, Mary looked at the little figures and thought, If I liked, I could make you go in there, or stop short. I could make you walk in single file, or in double file. I could do what I liked with you. Then Mrs. Seal came and stood by her. Oughtn't you to put something round your shoulders, Sally? Mary asked, in rather a condescending tone of voice, feeling a sort of pity for the enthusiastic, ineffective little woman. But Mrs. Seal paid no attention to the suggestion. "'Well, did you enjoy yourself?' Mary asked with a little laugh. Mrs. Seal drew a deep breath, restrained herself, and then burst out, looking out, too, upon Russell Square and Southampton Row, and at the passers-by. "'Ah, if only one could get every one of those people into this room, and make them understand for five minutes! But they must see the truth some day. If only one could make them see it!' Mary knew herself to be very much wiser than Mrs. Seal, and when Mrs. Seal said anything— even if it was what Mary herself was feeling, she automatically thought of all that there was to be said against it. On this occasion, her arrogant feeling that she could direct everybody dwindled away. "'Let's have our tea,' she said, turning back from the window and pulling down the blind. "'It was a good meeting, didn't you think so, Sally?' she let fall casually as she sat down at the table. Surely Mrs. Seal must realize that Mary had been extraordinarily efficient? "'But we go at such a snail's pace,' said Sally, shaking her head impatiently. At this Mary burst out laughing, and all her arrogance was dissipated. "'You can afford to laugh,' said Sally, with another shake of her head. "'But I can't. I'm fifty-five, and I dare say I shall be in my grave by the time we get it. 
if we ever do. Oh, no, you won't be in your grave, said Mary kindly. It'll be such a great day, said Mrs. Seal, with a toss of her locks. A great day not only for us, but for civilization. That's what I feel, you know, about these meetings. Each one of them is a step onwards in the great march. Humanity, you know. We do want the people after us to have a better time of it. And so many don't see it. I wonder how it is that they don't see it. She was carrying plates and cups from the cupboard as she spoke, so that her sentences were more than usually broken apart. Mary could not help looking at the odd little priestess of humanity with something like admiration. While she had been thinking about herself, Mrs. Seal had thought of nothing but her vision. "'You mustn't wear yourself out, Sally, if you want to see the great day,' she said, rising and trying to take a plate of biscuits from Mrs. Seal's hands. "'My dear child, what else is my old body good for?' she exclaimed, clinging more tightly than before to her plate of biscuits. "'Shouldn't I be proud to give everything I have to the cause? For I'm not an intelligence like you. There were domestic circumstances. I'd like to tell you one of these days. So I say foolish things. I lose my head, you know. You don't. Mr. Clacton doesn't. It's a great mistake to lose one's head. But my heart's in the right place, and I'm so glad Kit has a big dog, for I didn't think her looking well. They had their tea, and went over many of the points that had been raised in the committee rather more intimately than had been possible then and they all felt an agreeable sense of being in some way behind the scenes, of having their hands upon strings which, when pulled, would completely change the pageant exhibited daily to those who read the newspapers. Although their views were very different, this sense united them and made them almost cordial in their manners to each other. Mary, however, left the tea-party rather early, desiring both to be alone, and then to hear some music at the Queen's Hall. She fully intended to use her loneliness to think out her position with regard to Ralph, but although she walked back to the Strand with this end in view, she found her mind uncomfortably full of different trains of thought. She started one and then another. They seemed even to take their color from the street she happened to be in. Thus the vision of humanity appeared to be in some way connected with Bloomsbury, and faded distinctly by the time she crossed the main road. Then a belated organ grinder in Holborn set her thoughts dancing incongruously, and by the time she was crossing the great misty square of Lincoln's Inn Fields, she was cold and depressed again, and horribly clear-sighted. The dark removed the stimulus of human companionship, and a tear actually slid down her cheek, accompanying a sudden conviction within her that she loved Ralph, and that he didn't love her. All dark and empty now was the path where they had walked that morning, and the sparrows silent in the bare trees but the lights in her own building soon cheered her. All these different states of mind were submerged in the deep flood of desires, thoughts, perceptions, antagonisms, which washed perpetually at the base of her being, to rise into prominence in turn when the conditions of the upper world were favorable. She put off the hour of clear thought until Christmas, saying to herself, as she lit her fire, that it is impossible to think anything out in London, and, no doubt, Ralph wouldn't come at Christmas, and she would take long walks into the heart of the country, and decide this question and all the others that puzzled her. Meanwhile, she thought, drawing her feet up onto the fender, life was full of complexity. Life was a thing one must love to the last fibre of it. She had sat there for five minutes or so, and her thoughts had time to grow dim when there was a ring at her bell. Her eye brightened. She felt immediately convinced that Ralph had come to visit her. Accordingly, she waited a moment before opening the door. She wanted to feel her hand secure upon the reins of all the troublesome emotions which the sight of Ralph would certainly arouse. She composed herself unnecessarily, however, for she had to admit, not Ralph, but Catherine and William Rodney. Her first impression was that they were both extremely well-dressed. She felt herself shabby and slovenly beside them, and did not know how she should entertain them, nor could she guess why they had come. She had heard nothing of their engagement. But after the first disappointment she was pleased, for she felt instantly that Catherine was a personality, and, moreover, she need not now exercise her self-control. "'We were passing and saw a light in your window, so we came up,' Catherine explained, standing and looking very tall and distinguished, and rather absent-minded. "'We've been to see some pictures,' said William. "'Oh, dear!' he exclaimed, looking about him. This room reminds me of one of the worst hours in my existence, when I read a paper and you all sat round and jeered at me. Catherine was the worst. I could feel her gloating over every mistake I made. 
Miss Dashett was kind. Miss Dashett just made it possible for me to get through, I remember. Sitting down, he drew off his light yellow gloves and began slapping his knees with them. His vitality was pleasant, Mary thought, although he made her laugh. The very look of him was inclined to make her laugh. His rather prominent eyes passed from one young woman to the other, and his lips perpetually formed words which remained unspoken. "'We have been seeing old masters at the Grafton Gallery,' said Catherine, apparently paying no attention to William, and accepting a cigarette which Mary offered her. She leant back in her chair, and the smoke which hung about her face seemed to withdraw her still further from the others. "'Would you believe it, Miss Dashett?' William continued. "'Catherine doesn't like Titienne. She doesn't like apricots. She doesn't like peaches. She doesn't like green peas. She likes the Elgin marbles and grey days without any sun. She's a typical example of the cold northern nature. I come from Devonshire. Had they been quarrelling, Mary wondered, and had they, for that reason, sought refuge in her room? Or were they engaged? Or had Catherine just refused him? She was completely baffled. Catherine now reappeared from her veil of smoke, knocked the ash from her cigarette into the fireplace, and looked, with an odd expression of solicitude, at the irritable man. "'Perhaps, Mary,' she said tentatively, "'you wouldn't mind giving us some tea? We did try to get some, but the shop was so crowded, and in the next one there was a band playing, and most of the pictures, at any rate, were very dull, whatever you may say, William.' She spoke with a kind of guarded gentleness. Mary, accordingly, retired to make preparations in the pantry. "'What in the world are they after?' she asked of her own reflection in the little looking-glass which hung there. She was not left to doubt much longer, for, on coming back into the sitting-room with the tea-things, Catherine informed her, apparently having been instructed so to do by William, of their engagement. "'William,' she said, "'thinks that perhaps you don't know. We are going to be married.' Mary found herself shaking William's hand and addressing her congratulations to him, as if Catherine were inaccessible. She had, indeed, taken hold of the tea-kettle. "'Let me see,' Catherine said. "'One puts hot water into the cups first, doesn't one? "'You have some dodge of your own, haven't you, William, about making tea?' Mary was half inclined to suspect that this was said in order to conceal nervousness, but if so, the concealment was unusually perfect. Talk of marriage was dismissed. Catherine might have been seated in her own drawing-room, controlling a situation which presented no sort of difficulty to her trained mind. Rather to her surprise, Mary found herself making conversation with William about old Italian pictures, while Catherine poured out tea, cut cake, kept William's plate supplied, without joining more than was necessary in the conversation. She seemed to have taken possession of Mary's room, and to handle the cups as if they belonged to her. But it was done so naturally that it bred no resentment in Mary. On the contrary, she found herself putting her hand on Catherine's knee, affectionately, for an instant. Was there something maternal in this assumption of control? and thinking of Catherine as one who would soon be married, these maternal airs filled Mary's mind with a new tenderness, and even with awe. Catherine seemed very much older and more experienced than she was. Meanwhile, Rodney talked. If his appearance was superficially against him, it had the advantage of making his solid merit something of a surprise. He had kept notebooks. He knew a great deal about pictures. He could compare different examples in different galleries, and his authoritative answers to intelligent questions gained not a little, Mary felt, from the smart taps which he dealt as he delivered them upon the lumps of coal. She was impressed. "'Your tea, William,' said Catherine gently. He paused, gulped it down obediently, and continued. And then it struck Mary that Catherine, in the shade of her broad-brimmed hat, and in the midst of the smoke, and in the obscurity of her character, was perhaps smiling to herself, not altogether in the maternal spirit. What she said was very simple, but her words even, your tea, William, were set down as gently and cautiously and exactly as the feet of a Persian cat stepping among china ornaments. For the second time that day, Mary felt herself baffled by something inscrutable in the character of a person to whom she felt herself much attracted. She thought that if she were engaged to Catherine, she, too, would find herself very soon using those fretful questions with which William evidently teased his bride and yet Catherine's voice was humble. "'I wonder how you find the time to know all about pictures as well as books,' she asked. "'How do I find the time?' William answered, delighted Mary guessed at this little compliment. "'Why, I always travel with a notebook, and I ask my way to the picture gallery the very first thing in the morning.' 
and then I meet men and talk to them. There's a man in my office who knows all about the Flemish school. I was telling Miss Dashett about the Flemish school. I picked up a lot of it from him. It's a way men have. Gibbons, his name is. You must meet him. We'll ask him to lunch. And this is not caring about art, he explained, turning to Mary. It's one of Catherine's poses, Miss Dashett. Did you know she posed? She pretends that she's never read Shakespeare. And why should she read Shakespeare, since she is Shakespeare? Rosalind, you know. And he gave his queer little chuckle. Somehow this compliment appeared very old-fashioned, and almost in bad taste. Mary actually felt herself blush, as if he had said, The sex, or the ladies. Constrained, perhaps, by nervousness, Rodney continued in the same vein. She knows enough, enough for all decent purposes. What do you women want with learning, when you have so much else? Everything, I should say. Everything. Leave us something, eh, Catherine? Leave you something? said Catherine, apparently waking from a brown study. I was thinking we must be going. Is it to-night that Lady Farrelby dines with us? No, we mustn't be late, said Rodney, rising. Do you know the Farrelbys, Miss Dashett? They own Trantum Abbey, he added, for her information, as she looked doubtful. And if Catherine makes herself very charming to-night, perhaps will lend it to us for the honeymoon. I agree that may be a reason. Otherwise, she's a dull woman, said Catherine. At least, she added, as if to qualify her abruptness, I find it difficult to talk to her. Because you expect everyone else to take all the trouble. I've seen her sit silent a whole evening, he said, turning to Mary, as he had frequently done already. Don't you find that, too? Sometimes when we're alone I've counted the time on my watch. Here he took out a large gold watch and tapped the glass. The time between one remark and the next. And once I counted ten minutes and twenty seconds. And then, if you'll believe me, she only said, Um. I'm sure I'm sorry, Catherine apologized. I know it's a bad habit, but then you see, at home— The rest of her excuse was cut short, so far as Mary was concerned, by the closing of the door. She fancied she could hear William finding fresh fault on the stairs. A moment later the doorbell rang again, and Catherine reappeared, having left her purse on a chair. She soon found it, and said, pausing for a moment at the door, and speaking differently as they were alone, "'I think being engaged is very bad for the character.' She shook her purse in her hand until the coins jingled, as if she alluded merely to this example of her forgetfulness. But the remark puzzled Mary. It seemed to refer to something else, and her manner had changed so strangely, now that William was out of hearing, that she could not help looking at her for an explanation. She looked almost stern, so that Mary, trying to smile at her, only succeeded in producing a silent stare of interrogation. As the door shut for the second time, she sank onto the floor in front of the fire, trying, now that their bodies were not there to distract her, to piece together her impressions of them as a whole. And, though priding herself, with all other men and women, upon an infallible eye for character, she could not feel at all certain that she knew what motives inspired Catherine Hilbury in life. There was something that carried her on smoothly, out of reach, something, yes, but what? Something that reminded Mary of Ralph. Oddly enough, he gave her the same feeling, too, and with him, too, she felt baffled. Oddly enough, for no two people, she hastily concluded, were more unlike and yet both had this hidden impulse, this incalculable force, this thing they cared for and didn't talk about. Oh, what was it? End of chapter 14